Hello all my JavaScript friends, this is the Virtuoid, aka Mike Smith, and this is Fun with JavaScript, our racing game. Let's work with the tracks. Now after working with this for the last couple of days, I've gotten it down basically to where I can present the whole thing within a series of three videos. Now originally I was thinking it's going to be like five or six, but it's actually down to, I've got it down to three. Basically, the first video is going to cover the mathematics behind building these tracks and the different pieces that are involved to be able to construct the tracks that we want. And that's what this video is going to be all about. The second video is going to construct the track that you are looking at on your screen right now. This is going to be our test track. It's missing the starting gate and the finish gate at this time, uh, mostly because in the POC, I kind of hard coded both the starting gate and the ending gate, but I wanted to actually have a more generic routine. And so I'm in the process of building a generic routine. That's why you don't see it here. So that's what the second video will cover is how to build this track. And the third video will cover the actual starting gate and the finish gate itself, because mostly I don't have that done yet. Hopefully I'll have that done before the end of the day today. Uh, but that's going to be the three video series. Finally, we'll put it all together. We'll put the cars and the tracks and we'll run our races. So let's get started. Okay, before we begin, just a little bit of disclosure. I did not write the track code that we are getting ready to see. That was actually done by somebody who has a mathematics degree and they were taking a look at the code that I had developed and they said, you know, you really have no clue what you're doing, do you? And I said, I said no, no, you're, you're, I really don't. And he so graciously offered to build it for me and it turned out absolutely wonderful. And on top of that, he even wrote documentation for it. So let's go over the documentation. Now I'm not going to cover everything inside this documentation. It actually even goes into some, um, it, uh, it actually goes into some of the uh, mathematics that are involved with it. And to be honest with you, some of this stuff is really just beyond my, my scope of understanding. What I'm going to cover is the stuff that's particular to how we're going to build the track and what we're going to need to be able to do something that looks as pretty as this. So if you do want to take a look at all this documentation, it is part of the repository. It's under the docs directory. So just, just bring up your development server, go to the docs subdirectory and boom, there it all is. And you can kind of read through everything that you'll need uh, to be able to build the tracks. The first thing we're going to take a look at is the different parts of the track. Basically it's kind of divided into three sections. The first thing is a segment and a segment is the track. For example, Everything you see on this particular page right here, or this particular uh, design right here, is one segment. You can have multiple segments when you define your tracks. In fact, if you want to make some sort of jump or something like that, you would actually end up having multiple segments with a little slope on either side so you can have people jump from one track to the other. But the basic idea here is that a segment represents an entire run or a continuous run of track. Within each one, each Within each of these segments here is a grouping of sections and a section represents one piece of track. So for example, in this example here, there's one section that is this very long slope here. There's a section for the curve. There's another section for this slope. There's a, uh, a couple sections for this big uh, curve here, a section for this minor slope down at the bottom, and a, finally a section down at the very bottom that will represent eventually the finished gate. So a segment is made up of a group of sections, and that is mentioned right here. And the third part is a point, and a point is basically defines a certain space within the track from which it, you will be able to draw the track. So for example, a section contains two points, an entry point and an exit point. And these points then define between these particular points, they define what that particular track is going to look, at, look like. And how did they do that? Well, they use Bezier curves. And I hope I pronounced that right. I don't know if I've done it or not. I'm not going to go into what a Bezier curve does. It's got that. Some mathematics are right here. Uh, you, can go, you can Google it and just read up on it all day long. I'm going to show you how it pertains to our particular track. So, so here's the key. This is basically what a Bezier curve looks like. It's, got four, it's defined by four points. In this case, we got a point zero, point one, point two, and point three. 
The connection between point zero and point one makes a segment, or in the connection between point two and point three makes, uh, makes a, a segment two. And th these, these connections are basically tangents to that particular curve. And the definition of these segments, how they relate to each other, defines the shape of the curve. For example, if I was to take P1, and let's move it up a little bit, and that would be along the y-axis. By the way, again, x-axis is left to right, y-axis is up and down. The y-axis positive is up, the y-axis negative is down, the x-axis negative is left, and the x-axis positive is to the right. So if I was to bring P1 up some from five to, let's say, eight, we'll press the tab key here, notice that P1 moved up, and notice that our curve changed a little bit. Let me break it back down to five and back up to eight. You can notice that has actually changed. And the same thing with P2. If I was to take P2 now, and let's take the Y uh, on, the, on the P2, let's take the X, because it's left and right here, let's take the X and move it down to, let's say, two. It makes it shorter, it makes it shorter there, and it kind of elongates the curve just a little bit. So what would happen if I uh, put P1 and P2 exactly the same? Let's make that 10, 10. And make that 10, 10. And we got a very sharp curve right there. And here's what's wonderful about the particular uh, Bezier curves here. Let's get it back to kind of where it was. Let's put a five back right there and a five back right there. Is that for instance, if I move P1 over way over to the left, so let's say P1, uh, we'll put the uh, we'll put the x to be negative two. You can make all kinds of really funky looking curves and technically you can do this kind of stuff even with the track definitions because everything is done with Bezier curves. Now, I know what you're saying. Everything's not a curve. What about straights? Well, if all the points are lined up, then it becomes a straight. So for example, let's set P0 to um, 10. Well, it was at 10, 0 before. Let's, let's get it back to where it was so I can better figure out what's going on. So, Let's get it back to uh, 10, 0, and we got to go to 0, 10. So if we have this at 5, 5, and this at 5, 5, we have a straight line. So not only can we use the Bezier curves to do the curves, we can also use the Bezier curves to do the straight lines. Works great that way. It's, just, it's, it's really wonderful. So this is the Bezier curves. How do we have it implemented in with the game? Well, we have, have it implemented just slightly different. Remember, a section deals has two points, what's called an entry point and an exit point. So let's go down to the very bottom here, to this next section here. Same type of design here, P0, this is now basically what we're going to be looking at for uh, our, our game, for the tracks. So we have the entry point, which is P0, and the exit point, which is P3, but now we have what's called the forward vectors, the forward weight, and the backward weight. What does all that mean? Well, this is what it means. Let's take P0 first. That's still 10, 0, just as we had before. But now we're going to find a forward vector. And this forward vector basically says, okay, what direction is this track going to continue on from this particular point? And a, forward, and a vector basically is defined by having the number 0, 1, or even negative 1 within the values of the X and Y, or even within value of Z once we get to the three dimensions, which we'll show you here in just a second. And this basically now is, in this particular case here, it's saying that, okay, the direction I want the track to take is going to go positive in the Y direction and keep the same in the X direction, which means technically we could get it at a 45 degree angle if we went by having forward X to be one and you know Y to be one, or we can have X be negative one and Y to be one. We can, have, we can have a bunch of different directions. We're gonna keep it simple in this case, and even, and even with this one right here, um, I've, I've kept everything very simple just so we can understand what's going on. But we got that forward vector, and it basically says, okay, the direction of the track is going to go up the Y axis on the positive route. So again, remember, in this particular case, in this two dimensional case here, uh, the positive y is going up, so that would basically mean going up. The weight, in this case, is called the forward weight, basically says, okay, what is the distance to the P1 point, the assumed P1 point for the track? 
So that's what the forward weight does, is that it's saying, okay, it's going to be 5.51915024, and I'll explain actually in the next video why that number is 5.51915024. I'll explain that within the next video, but not right now. Don't worry about it. So just by having the information here for point zero saying, this is where it starts, this is the vector it's going to, the track's going to continue on, and this is how far away the P1 point is going to be. We now have this segment right here, and that's this, this, this line, which is tangent to the curve that we will be eventually creating. So that now gives us, just based upon this information, the center point, of the of the point which will be the center point of the track the vector the forward vector and the weight we now can get we can now can compute p0 and p1 all right well how about p2 and p3 well we have we have, we have to have two points so we're going to find the end point uh, or the exit point of this section and that's going to be p3 and it's very important to call it an exit point so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to have the x and y coordinates which obviously is very that's that's, that's obvious, we have zero and 10. And that's gonna give us the P3. But now we have the forward vector, because that's the same thing we'd find here. What does the forward vector do? The forward vector, just like it, does with, just like it was with P0, the forward vector in P3 says, okay, which way will the track go if I continue on? And that's gonna become very important for the next section of track, because the next section of track is gonna also kinda of figure is, is going to get its original point or a starting point from the exit point of the old section. And that's how you could put two, three, four hundred sections together, is that the beginning point of the, the entry point of, this, of the section you're working with is always equal to the exit point of the section that, you, that of the previous section. And the only exception to that rule is the very beginning starting point. But again, we'll get to that with, with, uh, within the next uh, video. But so the forward vector is saying, OK, now if you take a look at this curve here and if you were if you were a person or a car on this track, as you're going along this curve here, you're now facing off to the negative part of the x-axis. This is the way you're facing, not the way P2 is going, but this is the way you're facing. So our forward vector now is negative 1 in the x and 0 in the y, which says when this track continues, we don't want to move up and down. We want to move to the left, which is the negative part of x. Okay, so we got that, but still, how do we figure out P2? Well, to do that, we're going to have what's called a backward weight. And that backward weight basically says that, okay, that means I need you to flip it around and go this length to go find P2. So the backward weight basically says, okay, I, my forward vector is negative one on the X. So let's flip that around. Whoop, it's now one on the X. So one plus 5.51915024 should give me that P2. So by those, so by having this forward vector here, and this what we call backward weight, not forward weight, but backward weight, we now can compute both P3 and P2. So what do we have? We have P0, P1, P2, and P3, I'm sorry, P2 and P3 defined automatically for us. So all we have to do is define our entry point with a forward vector and a forward weight and, and, and an, exit, an exit point with a forward vector and a forward, I'm sorry, a forward vector and a backward weight. Now, by default, both the, both the weights are one by default. And if, again, if they are on the same line, if, if, if uh, X and if P0 and P3, uh, in this case, are on the same line, we're going to create a line. Because the whole idea here is, is that the forward vector and the forward weight or backward weight, depending upon whether you're on the entry point or the exit point, will define that distance for the system to be able to compute both P2 and P1. And once it has all that computed, it goes through its magic to be able to draw the nice, pretty little sections that you see right here. So let's take a look and see how all that works. Here is a sample section. And this is, this is, this is Babylon JS just like we have been using, but this is what a section uh, looks like. We've got a nice little, pretty little gentle slope here. So this is where we're going to start using three-dimensional graph, three-dimensional specifications for 
our, our um, so this is where we're going to start using three-dimensional specifications for defining our section. Now, what do we have here? We have an entry point, which is located right here. That's our entry point. And we have an exit point, which is located right there. Okay, so there's our entry and exit points. Let's take a look at what the code is. Again, we have two points, P0, P1. P0 is our entry point. And that center point is going, and it, we define it basically called a center point because it, it physically will be in the center of the track. So what happens when it actually draws the track at it, draws it from that center point. So it is called, in, in, when we do the, when we do the uh, track itself, it is always called the center point. So the center point of our entry is going to be eight to zero. Now in our three dimensionals here, in our three dimensionals, excuse me, in our 3D implementation, X axis is still the X axis. You can almost think of that as left and right. The Z axis is, you can kind of think about it as towards you and away from you. And of course this depends upon your orientation, whether that's correct or not. But the idea here is, is that X and Z kind of represents the X and Y that you see up top here. Our Y in this particular case is our, is our height and depth. So if you're on the earth, for example, uh, X would probably be west and east, Z would be north and south, and Y will be up to the sky and down to the ground. So that's basically what you will have um, or, or how the coordinates work within this game here. So Y is going to be our uh, depth and height. X is our left and right, and, and Z is our north and south. Okay, so that's going to be our center. That's going, that's going to define this, oopsies, that's going to define this point right here in the center of the, of the uh, track. Our forward vector is going to say, okay, I want to move negative one on the X, zero on the Y, and zero on the Z, which means I'm not going to, I'm not going, the next, the, the, the direction that the track is going to take does not go up or down, and it does not go left and right, or I mean, sorry, north and south, but it goes left and right, or east and west. In this case, negative one, again, I'm thinking of the earth, negative one means I'm going west. So this means that the track is going to go from, of course, the orientation all changes here, but the track's going to basically start from here and go straight down. Oops, all right, let's get that back in there so we can see it. And then the weight, the weight is in this case four. And I'll tell, you, I'll tell you how that comes into uh, play here in just a minute. P1, our center is negative 8, negative 2, and 0. So that basically means is that we're now going 16 pieces from, or 16 steps from this x to this next x. So we, our, our forward vector from our beginning was negative one, so we're going to the negative route for x. So we went from eight to negative eight, which means we went 16 steps to the negative. Our y is two, our y is now negative two. That's, remember, that's gonna be up and down, so that's a nice little pretty little slope going down. As you can tell, that's a nice pretty little slope going down. The z has not changed. Our forward vector on the second point is negative one, zero, zero. And again, the forward vector says, okay, what will be the continue, what will be the direction of the track if we continue from this point? In this case, we're going to continue on from this point straight on out from what you're looking at right here. Or, or probably better, for, now I don't know how we're going to look at, there we go. So kind of get it this way, the forward vector on the second one, which is up here, is going to say we're going to continue going out. So, and then the weight is forward. I'll get to that here in just a second what that means. Okay, so now, what we've done here is now create a straight. And how do we do a straight? Well, first of all, we can take a look at it that way. But second of all, it's a straight, it's not a curve because our X has changed, but our Z has remained the same. If we were to make a curve, then both the X and the Z, X and Z have to change. For instance, if you take a look up here and in our, in our sample that we had up here where X and Y, the X has changed and the Y has changed. Because both of those have changed, we're going to make ourselves a little curve. If one of those had remained the same, we'll end up making a straight line. So let's go back down to here. And first of all, I'm going to show you what the Y does. So if I did not change Y, my Y is 2. If I did not change Y, we put a 2 there. 
I end up with absolutely zero slope. I now got a completely straight line and I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep it like that. Uh, the weights basically mean absolutely nothing because let's put that back to negative two. When you have a straight, the weights basically will, as I, whoops, the weights basically will uh, move it, move the curve up and down, left or right, just like with the weight up here. If I was to change the weight to the, the backward weight, for example, to eight, notice that the curve has moved. So the weights are very important in getting that curve. They're not as important on a straight line with one exception. What you end up with is that, let's put that back to two. If you have a completely straight line, then the weights really mean absolutely nothing. But if you have some sort of slope, this is, this is only with a straight line. If you have some sort of slope, then what happens is that the weights, actually, let me get a little higher slope. Uh, let's do negative six. Yeah, okay, that, that would work a little bit better. So if you have a slope that looks, you know, it's this deep, what the weights will do is that they will push in the tops just like, just like, they will push in the tops as if they were, cur if they, as if they were curved, because basically they are curved. We do have a Bezier curve here that is on the x and y axis. It's just from our appearances here, the y axis is the depth. So, for instance, if I was to take, put zero weight on both of these. Oops, sorry, I can't have a zero weight. So let's put a, a very small weight of 0.01. Notice how absolutely almost perfectly straight it is. But if I actually had a backwards and forwards weight, notice how nicely sloped it is. And that's going to become very important because what you don't want to have happen here is to have uh, slopes. You know, when, when you're connecting up two sections of track, you don't want to have just a sudden, you know, change in, in um, sloping. For example, if you were to put a, uh, a level piece of, of section and a slope section together, you'll end up with a nice little angle down at the very bottom that you know, the cars will crash up against. But by adding weights here, you kind of help slope things out. Let me just kind of zoom in a little bit here. You kind of slope things out. There we go. That's nice. So notice how things are just sloped out just a little bit there instead of being completely uh, let's see, just do a 0 0.01. Instead of being completely straight, let me get both of them to 0 0.01. So instead of being completely straight like this, which would make a very hard little, almost like a speed bump, when, if you were to put a, a flat track there on the bottom, by putting the different weights here, you're able to kind of slope it out so the cars just kind of naturally come into the level playing field. And you'll see that I've done it here um, in this particular example here, I've got the beginning of my curve here, this 45 degree curve, but I've got a nice, pretty little slope. If I didn't have a, 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 backwards, a, a backwards weight on this, then that would have just come straight in and just hit the, the straight there, and it would just been a nice, pretty little angle, and the cars were all wrecked there. But not, by having that backwards weight, I've greatly smoothed out the transition between the slope and a straight piece of track. And so that's what the backwards weight will be able to do uh, for, for you. Now for curves, let's talk about, let's, let's go ahead and use this to create a curve. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to make it, uh, I'm going to make it completely straight. Now remember a curve, in fact, I'm going to take, just for funsies here, I'm going to take, put the weights back to zero ones. To make a curve, remember, uh, we're going to basically have changes in both the X and the Z axis. Right now we just changed X. We haven't changed the Z. I'm, not, I'm sorry, not axis, but points. So all it says here is that, oh, okay, I've gone uh, negative 16 here. Now for the Z, uh, the Z in this case goes, I can't remember which way now. The way my orientation is, I can't remember which way it is, but it doesn't really matter. Let's put a Z, we had negative 16 there, so let's put negative 16 for a Z there. Okay, cool. And look what we have. So now we have a straight line, it's kind of got it at a 45 degree angle, but here, here's, our, here's our situation, is that we're actually gonna want this to have a curve to go from, I'll tell you what, let's, 
let's make this just because it's kind of large in the screen here. Let's make that zero and this negative eight. That way we can kind of see things a little bit. We can zoom, oops, we can zoom in and see things just a little bit better. Do -do -do -do. Okay. So we're going to, we want to make this a, we want to make this a curve. Okay. So we want to make this basically coming in like this. Uh, we, we want to make the uh, forward vector coming in like this and the forward vector going out like this. So the forward vector is going to remain the same for the first point zero of our entry point. That's going to remain the same. And you can kind of see that. Let's, let's, uh, you can tell this is an error. Here's our forward vector. It's correct. But the problem is now that we've got, now that we've set it at, at a 45 degree angle, it's, it's really having problems, you know, making that look really nice. And the exact same problem is occurring with the forward vector on the final or the exit point. Is that it's wanting to point down, but we're pointing at a 45 degree angle. What we really want to do is we want to have this point to the right. And so that basically means that our new forward, our forward a vector is going to be zero on the x and negative one on the z. So now our new forward vector is going to be pointing that way. And that's correct because that's what we want to do. We want to have with our curve here, we want to have the entry point coming in from the north and we want to have the exit going out from the east. Okay, how are we going to make that curve? Well, how do we make a curve up here? By adding, by changing the different weights. So Here's our x, here's our exit, here's our, excuse me, here's our entry point. The forward weight defines how much this P1 is going to move out this way. And the further it moves out this way, the more it's going to start to curve. So what's our, what, what is our diameter that we want to use here? Well, right now we've got, a, we went from 8 to 0 and from 0 to negative 8. Basically our I'm not, not diameter, I'm sorry, what's our radius? Our radius basically in this case is eight. So what we could do here is just, let's just play around for numbers here. Uh, let's go ahead and do a forward weight of eight. Wow, that looks good. But is that correct? No, it's not. Well, actually it is correct, but no, it's not. It's, it's not the best way of doing it. Let's go back to our segment up here. Notice that this is a perfect curve. But notice our weights, actually it's not a perfect curve because I've been messing up this stuff here. Let's get that back to a five, uh, da -da, 0 0.51915024. Okay, so that's the perfect curve that we're looking for here. But notice that the weight itself is about half, it's a little bit more than half for each one of those. I could put the backward weight at zero and the forward weight at 10 in this case, and it would look okay, but it also won't be, it, it also means that we may, we, we may have some rendering problems a little bit later on with it. Uh, it's always best to try to equalize things out as much as possible to try to get the best curve fit that, that, that is possible. So what we're going to do here, I'm just, just for funsies, I'm going to go to halves. So I'm going to set the weight, our, our, um, our, um, the uh, radius is eight. So I'm going to set the weight to four there and notice how it, it, it nice starts, nice curve there, but nothing right here. So then I'm going to do the weight to four there and there's our nice, pretty curve. Does it line up? Let's find out. Let's see. Let's see if I can get that lined up correctly into the screen. Yep. See, nice and pretty, nicely lined up there. So that's the key. That's how we do the, uh, that's how we basically do a curve. In this case, it's a 45 degree curve. So every section is 45 degree curve. So I have, in this case, one section right here for the 45 degree curve. I have two sections right here for the 180 degree curve. If I wanted 365, uh, three, uh, 270, three of them. If I wanted 360, you don't, unless you want a spiral, which I'm not going to cover spirals, but we can actually do spiral elements here too. See, like that, but we, I'm not going to cover. I'm not going to cover that for this time. You can look that up a little bit later. Of course, you know we've got that. You know, if we really wanted to be really cute about it, we could. Let's drop the white down a little bit, and that would be a nasty little drop for you know. Imagine cars coming out of here and wham! So you can even drop on a curve. No big deal there. 
So that's really all it that's that's really all it is to it. There's a lot more to this than what than, than what I've shown you here. Like I said, we've got we've got a spiral, you've got a straight element which uh, uh, automatically uh, does what the Bezier curve does, but you know, just it's kind of a, a nice a nicer way of doing it. I, I like to I I like doing it this way. Uh, using the Bezier curves for everything. That way everything is as consistent as possible. But and that's pretty much all there is to the mathematics of working with the track here. So our next video, we're going to build the track. If you like this video, please click on the like button below, subscribe to this channel, or leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. We're trying to get 1 million subscribers by February of 2042, so your subscription will help us out immensely. Thanks again very much for watching. This is The Virtual Wide, a.k.a. Mike Smith. We'll see you later.